Okay. Well, uh, so we've got some callers lined up, and uh, I was thinking that we could uh, first take Harad from Iran, because it seems like he is actually read unapologetic and would like to talk about some specific points in that book. Hello, Harad, are you on? Hi, yes, I'm on. How are you guys? Hi, good. How are you? G yes, good. Great. So... John, I read your book, but I'm still in the middle of the chapter five. So just uh, taking up some points that you discussed with um, about your defense of the new atheists. Oh, yes. yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, OK, so like what are you Richard talking Dawkins about? And, is... like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, exactly. P.Z. Myers and others that I defended, sure. Yeah, OK, so. Uh, one thing you pointed out, and I think you were really, really right on this point, was that the method of the old atheists, comparing it to the new atheists, is really outdated. Mm. So, for example, what I mean is that uh, if it wasn't for the new atheists, I wouldn't really be an atheist right now. I wouldn't know of people who were or who are atheists. And yeah. also, I wouldn't know of other people like you, like Graham Oppie, like Schellenberg. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so how would you then, um, because you touched on the post-theism bit in your book, and you've also talked about that uh, if we try to respond to this criticism or to their arguments for God, we have to do it over and over again because they just keep coming and um, it adds credibility to theists. But you also say that in your book that you want to change minds. Yes. So so how, how would you then, it seems to me to be a paradox here. Okay, because... uh, yes it is. Um, I understand, uh, let's see if I can put your uh, question in terms of uh, that others can understand because I myself had a bit of difficulty understanding it. Um, you, you like the fact that um, the new atheists exist because uh, they propelled atheism into the forefront and um, their uh, modus operandi yeah. would be to uh, stress for evidence. Where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? We don't want to go into this mumble jumble of um, theology and philosophy in order to believe exactly, or not believe. Exactly. Uh, we, we want the evidence. Their stress was on the evidence. Uh, uh, P.Z. Myers, a courier's reply was based on the evidence. Where's the evidence? You know, otherwise we're going to uh, treat you like um, the emperor with no clothes. We're just going to laugh at you and stuff like that. So uh, it gets a lot of people, uh, you know, they sit up in their seat and they say, well, where is the evidence? And all of a sudden, all of their gerrymanderings and all of their philo philosophical reasonings uh, seem to uh, be akin to discussing the height and the weight and the characteristics of Superman. Uh, or the fairies or how fast the Superman could fly. Well, first, let's have some evidence there is a Superman. Right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, but what about other philosophers of religion like Graham Obey? Uh, I, revere, uh, I, I really uh, think highly of him as one of the yeah, me too. preeminent uh, philosophers of religion. Well, um, I, I think you probably read what I said about that. Uh, what he's done in uh, his latest book describing gods is to uh, discuss um, the characteristics of Superman. Yeah, yeah, I've read the book. Yeah, yeah. He, what he's doing in, in the book uh, describing gods is he's describing uh, the characteristics of Superman. Can he fly faster than a bullet? Uh, can a bullet penetrate his skin? Can he? Yeah, uh, yeah. But can, the point can, remains, though. You're going to have to let me answer. I, you're going to you're gonna have to let me answer. Okay, okay. Go on, go on. Um, or whether he can, whether Superman can move the earth. Well, well, first, where is Superman? First, let's find out whether there's any evidence for God. Where where is this God? Uh, otherwise. We're just playing a game with Christians who already need our um, our our approbation. I mean, we, we uh, let's say it's a, uh, approbation. Maybe that'd be a wrong word, but our encouragement. If we start taking them seriously when they start talking about things like hell and how hell can be either palatable or impalatable without looking at the evidence for hell, where is hell? Um, and who believed it and why they believe it. We have to look at the evidence for hell. We have to look at the evidence for God. We have to look at the evidence for Jesus. We have to look at that evidence. And if the evidence is not there, then what we're doing when we pick one version of hell or one version of Jesus or one version of God out of the mix of myriads of numbers of gods and hells and Jesus, 
then what we're doing by dissecting that particular belief, we're putting more emphasis on that. We're actually saying that is the best view of God there is, or that is the best view of hell there is, or that is the best view of uh, Jesus there is. And we're, we're picking on that argument to dis discuss it because we think that's the best thing. I God. agree. But so by doing that, we've already decided among the many different views of gods and Jesus and hells, which ones have more merit. And I don't think that we should do that. Once we do that, and rather than put them all in the mix of all kinds of different views of hells and all different kinds of views of Jesus and all kinds of view, different views of gods, then people, religious, actually see uh, what's going on. They have different views because there's no evidence for them. And if the evidence doesn't convince them, I don't know um, that philosophical reasoning is going to do it. Now, I'm not saying that you don't do that. I'm just saying, if you do it in the classroom, you should uh, tell the truth to your students. And I'm talking mainly to atheist philosophers of religion. Tell the truth to yeah, your yeah, students. Yeah, yeah, I read that, yeah. So I, I think the question is partly, uh, does arguing with theists in general kind of legitimize them in a way that they weren't already legitimized in well, the first place? Well, it's the same that John makes in his book. Mm -hmm. And I agree. What I'm saying is that how else can you... You know, change people's minds. You you have no way except to engage with them. Hmm. Well, um, and I, this engaging with them. Okay, go ahead. Well, like for instance, okay, uh, does God exist? Well, you can talk about the philosophical arguments for the existence of God, the argument for reason, or the ontological. Or they are rubbish. Uh, the, but okay, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Or or you can just turn to the Bible. Open it up, find out about the God in the Bible, and his name is Yahweh, right? And then look at his characteristics, and look who believed in him, and find out things uh, by looking at extra uh, canonical literature that he was the son of El, um, and uh, that he had a wife. Uh, otherwise, how did he have sons and, and daughters? Of, you know, how were there sons and daughters uh, uh, from uh, Yahweh unless he had a wife? Why, the wife was cut out of the, the Old Testament. Asherah was her name. Uh, and ask yourself... Okay, now, this is the God uh, that uh, evolved into the God I believe in, and you ask yourself whether or not you believe in Yahweh. Now, if you don't believe in Yahweh, you can't believe in God. I mean, you shouldn't okay, be able to so, so you look at what the Bible has to say. You look at what science has to say. Evolution basically discredits almost all religions. Um, and it's not, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily prove all religion is wrong. If you're asking me to prove that a religion is wrong from science, you're asking too much of science. Uh, but you do see that it's very improbable that any religion is wrong, and that's okay, good, and that's good the, enough. The point, I, uh, if the I, point that I'm making, though, um, is that um, you remember your book, Why I Became an Atheist. That I, was I, I awesome. don't remember much about it anymore. I've had a few <laughs> drinks and then. Uh, well, if, I've translated this into Persian, and oh, it's available for oh, download. Oh, I remember you now, yes. <laughs> okay. If, if and, I can uh, jump in and maybe address the, the concern you have, uh, Okay. I, I think that maybe the way to approach these arguments is to, uh, first of all, I, is to maybe personalize the argument and make it clear that you are arguing with the person on their own terms and, and in that way sort of conditionally accept that what they're saying is true, but, but uh, make sure they get that you're taking it as seriously as, say, you might take an argument about Superman, right? Uh, it's possible to have no, no, an argument I'm saying, about whether no, I'm Superman... Saying could, that, okay. I, I'm not saying that we have to take it seriously. I mean, right. sometimes we have no choice but to do that. Okay, well, so for example... Well, and I'm saying if I want you to, do have a choice. Uh, like, well, no, so, no, no, I... I um, okay, you need to read the rest of the book first off, okay? <laughs> and I'm going to ask okay, you later, I'm going to ask maybe. you later, I'm going to give you a test. Right. If you don't pass the test, then you know, I'm going to have to flunk you. All right. But once you read the whole book, okay. you'll find out uh, that what I'm talking about is uh, more nuanced than that. Yes, we have to deal with versions of hell. Yes, we have to deal with versions of God. Yes, we have to deal with versions of, uh, of Jesus. Right. Uh, one after another, if we have to. If we're going, to, we're going to write a scholarly book on Jesus, then we have to deal with all those versions of Jesus. Yes, we have to. But it's, it's best done in the context where you deal with them all. It's, uh, uh, you can't just pick out on, say, uh, um, the uh, traditional view of hell where, um, um, you know, there's everlasting conscious uh, yeah, suffering. Yeah. You, you can't do that. Otherwise, if you do that, you're saying this, this version of hell has more merit to it such that I'm going to deal with it. But if you write a chapter on, the, on versions of hell and you deal with a bunch of them, 
I mean, a bunch of them, or a book on hell, and you write a book on a bunch of them, then it puts all these versions of hell in the same context, which is where they should be. So you deal with them, yes, but only in the context of, uh, of uh, religion in general. That's why I advocate comparative religion, the anthropology of religion, and psychology yeah, yeah. of religion as you, you might know this, but my, re my listeners don't want, might know, that, know this. So I, okay, go on. we have to deal with religion in the context, I mean, of, of the world religion. And if you don't do that multiculturally, then what you're doing is that you're saying, my parochial religion has more merit to it than others. And I think that's what's doing uh, us harm, because Christians themselves, if we just deal with their versions and don't talk about multiple cultural versions of religion, they tend to think that they've got the, uh, the major alternative to atheism. And if they have the major alternative to the atheism, all they have to do is like attack atheism, and they, they ride high and they act like they're, they're, they're going exactly. somewhere. Exactly. That's, that's the problem we have in Iran, because Muslims think exactly. that all the options are either atheism or Islam. Right, right. So mm -hmm. what they've got, what they've got you involved in a, um, a vicious cycle, uh, you've got to break. You've got to break if you want to get anywhere with them, and you don't want to get killed either, of course. So. Uh, Harad, <laughs> I mean, I, I'd like to ask you something. Um, I mean, okay. I, I'm assuming that you don't get into these arguments very publicly. I mean, uh, I'm not going to assume much about your personal position, but uh, is... Well, I do get in at, uh -huh. as far as I can, like in university, for example, during question hours, mm -hmm. they are somehow open to the questions. Not really. You have to be careful, uh, but you can. So yeah. um, when you get in these uh, conversations, I guess, uh, you know, are you mainly trying to sort of soften the position of fellow students or professors or... Uh, you, you know, in, in what Doubt. context do you get in, in arguments? I, I just try to instill doubt, you know, just mm -hmm. try to um, add the possibility that they can see that things can be otherwise. Because the thing is, uh, the, the, dif the main difference between the West and the, the East and mainly the Middle East is that People are not used to hearing these kinds of criticism. Mm -hmm. They were, but not for a long time after after the so-called golden age of Islam. So they are not used to hearing this. So they just dismiss it right out. Yeah. So, for example, the problem of evil is just really laughed off as this silly, as this kind of silly, like excuses. Yeah, atheist. Well, and of course, if you're if you're chopping just off. a minute, it, I mean, it sounds like you're running into a particular sticking point when you try to get into these arguments because you're not sure how much uh, conditionally to uh, to basically accept Islam or or their their particular arguments. Uh, like by arguing against it, you sort of also validate it. Is that uh, your main concern? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the other con concern is that if I don't talk about it, if I don't criticize it, if I don't translate these books like by Dawkins or Harris or by your guests, then or not criticize, you know, the locally religious conditions in my country, then w what can I do to make things better? You know, so I have well, to start from somber. Your uh, your position is different than the position of say ninety nine percent of the people who will read my book, and mm -hmm. I didn't write about your position. I didn't write about your particular scenario. Um, but if I were to add a chapter or a section on it, I would say <laughs> that you really do need to break through to talk when you talk about versions of hell or versions of problem of evil. You need to to package them in uh, a, a comparative religion sense, you know, where um, you're writing about all the different versions. Well, now, I'm not saying that's going to work. I'm not saying anything I say is actually going to work either. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm talking about in principle, whereas you're asking me to talk about in practice. Mm -hmm. Now, you might not be able to be a professor in the philosophy of religion classes who can actually tell your students the truth either. You might teach in Houston, Texas, for instance, and if you do that, you might get fired or you might get... Uh, uh, banned if you tell your students that faith is uh, is irrational, uh, or if you're in Iran, it could be worse. And in Iran, yeah, it, I it, took it, up, Iran is worse. I took up free will, and I was but, in really but, big trouble. But that doesn't undermine the I, that doesn't undermine the fact that you should try if you can. Now, if you can't, you can. And I understand perfectly well why you can't. I, I think that okay. So uh, the main point. Can I ask uh, John a question? Sure. Um, 
the the main point is that you were so good in your book and uh, why I became an atheist and you said before that you become a little jaded and you moved on from projects of this kind but the part of your book your present book that was concerned with the um, argument for the 11th century theologian and philosopher um, i forgot the name of the argument the ontological argument and um, you were so good at criticizing the argument and offering a really great rebuttal. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. To it. Yeah, it's really awesome. <laughs> and, um, well, good. I yeah, want. I make you feel good. You... Yeah. Well, you you really deserve it, but I think you deserve much much more um, much more popularity and much more reputation, at least on a par with Grayling, I think. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, um, your works are really influential, and uh, they proved really influential within people of uh, people like me in, in Iran. Well, well thank so you. So the download so rates has been crazy, and mm -hmm. uh, I cannot say the numbers because uh, if I say the numbers, they can check the counters, and I've stayed on the online for not a long, for somehow a long time. So I'm risking, uh, oh, okay, you go. know, myself and I need to say goodbye. But before I say this, you're so good at offering, you know, counter apologetics. You're really good at it. And I hope you continue writing books like that. Uh, even if you think that it's really, you know, <laughs> sometimes really a stupid subject to talk about and one can you know how it is you have an argument you refute it the premises change planting offers another one william lane craig offers another one and they all are refuted a hundred times so maybe just for those of us who are in the middle uh, and i see you know, because it was your books that changed my position to the kind of the strong atheist. Mm. And so I think if you could read that, if you could write that again, it would really change things for people like me. So I wish you could continue that. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you for calling, Harad. Uh, and, okay. uh, you know, good, good luck with your situation over there. Yeah. And, uh, well, you got a fan. <laughs> Congratulations. He, he, he and my mom make two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we generate some more today.